If you have your Bibles with you, if you want to turn to the bulletin as well, if you want to look on the screen, uh, however way you do it, I want you to turn to the Word of God now. We're going to look at the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Here another Word of God. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in between the times of Jesus' ascension into heaven and Jesus' return at the end of history and the full establishment of your kingdom. And when Jesus was here on this earth, he was fully God and fully human, but because of his full humanity, he had to be in one place at one time. And now in this in-between time, you send your Holy Spirit so that we can experience the living presence and power of Christ wherever we are in all times and all places across the whole earth, even here and even now. And so, Holy Spirit, I, I pray that you would speak. I pray that you would help us to listen. I pray that you'd fill in the gaps of whatever I've left out in this message so that make sure your word is the word they hear, your truth is the one that sets them free. So bless me to be a blessing in all these ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I was sitting in my office here at the church about a week ago when the power went off. Uh, which happens now and then when a storm uh, comes. Uh, there was no storm, however, the day. It was a sunny day, clear blue skies, no storm on the horizon, nothing in the forecast, and it just stopped. And if you're ever kind of working and, and busy, uh, there's noises going on around you, your computer's humming, you're jamming away, you're concentrating that I had music going, and all of a sudden, boom, it just stopped very suddenly. And my first thought was, are you kidding me? What now? What next? <laughs> What else are we going to have to face? I know 2020 has officially come to an end, but the crazy crisis mode of the last 10 or 11 months is still continuing. And so I got up from my desk and I ran outside because I wanted to see how widespread the outage was. And I was expecting to see something crazy, something crazy, like a swarm of murder hornets taking out a transformer on the side of the road, like an angry mob violently marching down Dixie Highway, maybe even an alien invasion or a zombie apocalypse. Of course, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding when I say I wouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> it's been that kind of year, right? Anything, what else, what next is going to happen? Well, it turned out to be much ado about nothing. Apparently the power in our area had to be shut off briefly for some construction project they didn't notify us about. And after a short while, the power was back on and we were up and running. But when I sat down at my desk again to work on my sermon, I suddenly remembered the third week in September of 2008. Any of you who lived here at that time, do you remember what happened the third week of September in 2008? That's when the remnants of Hurricane Ike made their way up into our area. You never would have expected the winds of a hurricane to come this far north, but it was crazy. It took off a lot of the shingles and the roof of the church. It took off the shingles at my house. There were trees down over power lines and the power was cut off to a million homes in our area and it lasted a long time. It was crazy. And of course, we didn't suffer near as much as the people on the coast of Texas, but it still caused us quite a bit of grief. And most of our grief was related to that loss of power. 
it was strange. It was sometimes scary. It was a hassle for everyone. Schools and community events were shut down. Kind of a preview of coming attractions, if you will. The street lights didn't work. Everybody was staying inside. The stores were closed. It was just incredibly different. The food in your freezer was going to go bad in your refrigerator. And everybody wasn't sure what to do and was surprised that it was going to take so long to fix. We felt powerless. Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever felt powerless? I certainly have. Particularly during this past year. I don't know about you, but there were many times that I thought, what next? What else? That's it. I'm tapping out. I've had enough. That's all I can handle. And if you get to that place of you're just at the end of yourself, then that may be a very good place to be. If you turn in the right direction at that moment, if you come to the end of yourself and you turn in the right direction, it may be the start of a great new chapter in your life. I want to talk about some other people that felt powerless and then the contrast between their powerlessness and the power that they received. One day, 11 terrified disciples sit in an upper room, huddled together, and they were at their wits end. They didn't know what else was gonna come. The worst thing they could imagine had happened to them. You wouldn't look at that people and think this group of people is about to turn the kettle of history onto a high boil. They didn't look very likely. They were uneducated, they were confused, they had calloused hands and a narrow set of skills and no social graces. They had a limited knowledge of the world. They didn't have any money. They had undefined leadership, undefined action plans, on and on. If you looked at this motley crew, you wouldn't bet on them to change the world for the better. Worse than the resumes was their sense of powerlessness. They had witnessed their Lord die and with him died their hopes their dreams, their whole vision for the future. They got to a place that they couldn't see beyond. They couldn't see beyond where they were in that moment. My mom sometimes used to say, sometimes you feel as low as a snake's belly in a wagon rut. You ever heard that? It's what a ridic- My mother was full of ridiculous sayings. And that was one of those, as slow as a snake's belly in a wagon rut. They probably felt like that. They felt so powerlessness, but then something changed. Two things changed that changed them from being powerless to being powerful, which led to them being used to God to radically change the world for the better. Now, the first thing that happened, I'm going to talk about just briefly. The first thing was that Jesus was alive. Jesus was alive, raised up from the dead. He appeared to them face to face and he wasn't raised from the dead like Lazarus had been raised from the dead only to die again. He was raised from the dead, never to die again. He wasn't resuscitated. He was resurrected, which proved he had conquered death itself. And with that victory, he opened the doors to heaven and closed the door to hell for all who would trust in him. We sing that song, there's power in the blood, the cross, there's power in the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins, to reconcile us with God. And when he was raised from the dead, it proved that his payment was sufficient for all the sins of the world. And he conquered sin and death and hell, a great powerful event in history. But it's the second event I wanna focus on. For I believe it was the one that really turned up the power in their lives. The risen Christ appeared to them. And as recorded in Luke 24, this transpired. Then he, Christ, opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city and you've been clothed with power from on high. Now, it just occurred to me that they heard this, Luke 24, before the cross, before the resurrection, and still they felt powerless, still they felt hopeless. They still didn't believe that God was really going to do what he promised to do. Now, the Greek word used for power here is dunamis, for which we get our English words dynamic and dynamo, even dynamite. And Jesus says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will clothe you with God's power. It'll become yours, like you're wearing it, like you can use it, like a part of your daily life. But they're told to stay and wait in Jerusalem. Now, I don't think it was probably any easier for them than it is for us to be told to wait. 
Uh, in the moment of waiting, we can be discouraged, we become depressed, we become hopeless and helpless. Maybe that's what's going on. They're waiting, what next, what next? And they become overly anxious. Sometimes we wanna go back to doing what's familiar to us, and apparently some of them did. They went back to Galilee and started fishing again. Maybe the tendency was to be half-cocked, to kind of go off and say, I gotta fix something. I gotta fill the gap left by Jesus somehow as if I can step into his place and fill his shoes. But apparently they finally settled down and they waited. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, let me read that part again. Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hit him from their sight. And then about a week or so later, the story goes on in Acts chapter two, where it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as Spirit enabled them. I'm not gonna focus on the specific phenomenon of that day, the wind, the fire, the speaking in other languages. I wanna focus instead on the simple reality that something unusual happened. Something changed their lives. A power came down from heaven and entered in to women and men and enabled them to do and to be what they could never do and be before, which enabled them to be used by God to change the world for the better. To be used by God to change the world for the better. Now, one day, on the day of Pentecost, many people were crowded into Jerusalem. And so the apostle Peter saw the evangelistic opportunity that this represented. And so he stood up to preach his first sermon. How would you expect him to do, really? Now, this was a person that had no experience in this. He had no formal training, he had no formal education. This was less than two months after he violently denied even knowing Jesus. This was the man who, even after seeing Jesus come back to life, decided to go back to Galilee to fish this was a man who was infamous for putting one foot after another into his mouth. What respectable church today would even let a man like this step into a pulpit? But when Peter's sermon was finished, over 3,000 people committed their lives to Jesus Christ. They were saved by grace through faith in Christ. There was never been another altar call quite like it. But please be clear about very one important thing. It wasn't about Peter. It wasn't about his sermon. It wasn't about anything particular that he said. The miracles that happened that day were the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. I've often thought that they ought to retitle the book of Acts from the Acts of the Apostles to the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit animating the lives of the apostles that made these things happen. What gave birth to the church that day? What is absolutely essential? What is really necessary to make a positive and lasting difference in the world? It is power, not just any power, but the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God. How long has it been in your life? How long has it been in our church? And since something happened, you said, only God could do that. Only God could make that possible. That's not something we could ever begin to take credit for. If it has been a long time, and I suspect for many people it has, then maybe we need to do what Jesus told them to do, wait and watch and pray. And then maybe you'll see that God is doing more than you think he is. Maybe God is responsible for things you've been taking credit for. Maybe you'll see that God is moving or maybe God's gonna move in a new way. But in order to be ready for that, you gotta wait and you gotta pray. When that storm left us without power and other storms that have left us without power, it didn't mean the power was gone. It just meant it was on elsewhere and we were somehow disconnected from it. Maybe that's where you're at right now, disconnected from the power of God. I'm challenged by this statement from a pastor named Dr. Jerry Vines. He wrote, the average Christian in the average church are somewhere bogged down between the cross on Calvary and Pentecost. They've been to Calvary for pardon, but they've not been to Pentecost for power. Bethlehem means God with us. Calvary means God for us, but Pentecost means God in us. Think about it. If God is really in us, then there ought to be power available to us. And I think the modern day Christian and the modern day church have often lost the sense of the power of God when it comes to churches and denominations. Too many are just like social clubs 
or civic organizations or indistinguishable from the United Way or things like that, kind of do-good organizations or self-help life coaching centers that preach a pop psychology sprinkled with a little bit of scripture here and there. Just like Samson in the Bible, they don't even know that the power of God has left them. One day, John Wesley said, I don't fear that the people called Methodists will not exist on the face of the earth. I fear that someday they will have the form of religion, but deny its power, but deny its power. Do you remember the story of Samson? Samson was one of the strong men, well known for his feats of strength, but he was a judge in the Old Testament in that period of history. And one day he decided to put his head into Delilah's lap a pagan woman who dishonored God at every opportunity. And as he slept, she cut off his hair. And that hair symbolized his commitment to God and mostly his reliance on the power of God. It wasn't his power ever. It was the power of God on which he relied. And the hair symbolized that promise and that vow and that commitment. Know this, she didn't take his power. He let it go. He let it go by being self-indulgent, by being self-focused, by thinking he was self-reliant, by depending on Delilah and the, the pleasures of the flesh that he thought that she would provide. And she was able to take his power because in that moment he trusted in Delilah more than he trusted in a God. And as a result, he lost his power. He could do nothing but leave, live a defeated life. And soon he was blind and he was bound and he was going in circles, working at the mill of his enemies. I can't remember where I first read this or heard this, but I've always liked this quote. It says, trying to live the Christian life or to be the church, while being plugged into the power of God leaves us just like Samson, blinded by the devil, bound up in a Mickey Mouse religion and grinding in the millstone of the world in weakness and defeat. God wants better for us than that. I read about a seminary professor named Herbert Jackson who at one time was a missionary and he told about his first missionary assignment and he got to the place and they assigned him a car to use in the rounds that he had to make, but they said that the car wouldn't start on its own, it needed to push. Some of you have, still have or remember having a car with a manual transmission, so you know how that works. If you can't start the car, you can get some people to help you push it or you can roll it down a hill, you can pop the clutch, it'll turn the motor and then the car will start. Uh, I had to do that many times. I had a car that had to park on a hill for a long time uh, when I was in college. And so he had a car like that and so so he went to the, the mission school, got some kids out of class, asked them to push start the car. And from that time on, he tried his best to always park on a hill or to leave the motor running. And if not, he had to find people to help him push the car to get it started. Well, time came for him to go back to the States to leave his missionary assignment and a new missionary came in. So he was explaining to him this protocol and this plan he had for making the car work. And in the middle of his explanation, the other missionary opened the hood of the car and started looking at the engine. And then finally he said, Dr. Jackson, sorry to interrupt you, but I believe the only problem is this loose cable. And so he turned and twisted that cable, stepped into the car, pushed the switch, and to Jackson's astonishment, the car roared to life. In other words, the power had been there the whole time available for him to use. He just had a loose connection. If we want to do God's will, if we want to accomplish God's purposes in this world, that we need to be connected to the power of God. And that power is the Holy Spirit. So how do we get connected? Or how do we get reconnected if we become disconnected? I think you already know. In fact, I, I just want you to really think about that. I think you already know. I mean, it's unique to you, but if there was a time when you felt really close to God and now you don't, if there was a time you felt really empowered and now you don't, it's often said that if you feel distant from God, it's not God who moved away because God has promised to never leave or forsake his children. So if you feel distant from God, it's because you've turned away. You've turned away in big ways or small ways, but cumulative effect is you feel powerless. You feel powerless. So think about that and what needs to change in your life. It may be some kind of obvious examples. Maybe you need to spend more time in the Bible. Maybe you need to spend more time in prayer. Maybe you need to spend more time in service to other people in Jesus' name, as he said, giving a cup of cold water to a person in need in his name. Maybe you need to spend time with other believers and that fellowship and that encouragement and that mutual accountability and challenging. Maybe you need to spend more time in worship, more time in sharing your faith, giving more to support the work of Christ through the church. In other words, you need to spend more time with God. You need to spend more time with God, investing in that relationship so you can be filled and connected to the power of God. But maybe also you need to hear these basic instructions from the book of Acts. 
When people asked what they should do to be saved after Peter's sermon, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So in effect, he was saying this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's meant for all the children of God, all of those who come to Christ by grace through faith, all of those people, not a special group of people, not a special chosen group of people, but every person that says the yes of faith to Jesus. So if you're a baptized Christian, that means you've got the Holy Spirit. You may feel disconnected, but it's available to you. God's promise is that you have the Holy Spirit. And if you're not a Christian, then you need to become one. You need to repent of your sin. You need to believe and put your faith in Jesus, be baptized into his church and take up this life of discipleship and this life of power. And if you are a Christian, then maybe what you need to do is repent, repent. The word repentance means basically that you recognize you're going the wrong way. You come to your senses and then you turn around and go in a new direction. The Greek word is metanoia. You turn around, go a new way. In the case of Christianity, it means you confess your sin. You acknowledge it. You admit your weaknesses to God. You cry out for mercy and God gives you grace and then he helps you to walk in a new direction. Well, in this context, I think the wrong way is trying to do it yourself, trying to live for yourself, trying to live for your own desires or trying to depend on the wisdom and the ways of the world instead of the words of God. Or for the Christian, it may be trying to live God on your own, trying to live with your own power and asking God to kind of watch from a distance. And if you're gonna live like that, it's like pushing a car to get it started, but uphill, uphill, it's not gonna work. It's exhausting and it's just not gonna work. Now, please understand, if you think Christianity is about trying harder to make a difference in the world, then you've missed the point. The Bible is clear, we cannot change the world on our own. We cannot make a positive difference in the world. We're more likely to make it worse instead of better if we're doing it in our own power. We cannot change a person's heart. We can't even change our own heart. We can't save ourselves, let alone other people. But God can, God can do all things. The apostle Paul realized how much this was true and he wrote, I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. In the end, people don't need us. They need God in us. They don't need us. They need God in us so God can flow through us to them. What we need to remember is the Holy Spirit is great enough to overcome all our shortcomings, all our failures. He can work through the limitations of insufficient talent, insufficient intelligence or upbringing. God is able to use you and me for our good and for his glory. And for our part, making a difference in the world is not about our ability, but our availability our willingness to yield ourselves to the work of the Spirit. So we say, it's not me. It's not me. God is using me and I feel privileged to be used of God, but it's, it's not about me and what I bring to the situation. So the Great Commission tells us to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Christ commanded. And that's why Jesus gives us the Spirit, so we can take up that work, so we can spread us out over the face of the earth to carry on the good work that he began. And so he had to animate our lives with the same power that animated his life on earth. I want to go back to when that big storm happened and it took away people's power in 2008. I'm ashamed even now to admit it that my home didn't lose power. Uh, millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people lost their power, but there were three houses on my street that didn't lose their power. We have no idea to this day why we had power and they didn't. It was seemed so incredibly random. Uh, you could go for blocks in any direction and there was other people that didn't have power, but we didn't have power. I wasn't worthy of that blessing, but I'm grateful for it because it enabled me to make some observations that I want to share with you that relate, I think, to our calling as Christians. So I'm going to share five things. First of all, you could clearly recognize those who had power and distinguish them from those who didn't. What was the big difference? At night, the lights were on. At night, the lights were on. And you could see that light shining out. And that light gave hope. That life gave encouragement. That light meant that there's people there that might be able to help me. If you're a Christian, 
The light of Christ should be visible in your life. And you should do all you can do to open the shutters and to open the doors and to let it shine for everybody. The Bible says that if you'll stay out of the way, people will see God through you, through you. And the second people is the people in po with power were in a unique position to help the people without it. Uh, my mother and father-in-law in Cincinnati were without power and they had a big deep freezer that was packed uh, to the gills. And we thought to ourselves that if we just kind of keep it closed, it'll stay frozen for a while. So we loaded the whole thing in the back of a pickup truck, drove it down to our house and plugged it in. And I guess other people in the neighborhood saw us doing that. So they started bringing their appliances over to our house. Uh, we had power strips on our front porch for people to charge their phones. We had extension cords running from our house to our neighbor's houses. People came over to, to cook food so it wouldn't spoil. The point is this, having power gives you a special ability, but mostly a special responsibility to help the people around you that don't have power. If you know the love of God, if you enjoy the love of God, if you've got the support of a church family, then you're in a privileged position. And with that privilege comes a great responsibility to help people that don't have those things. And the third thing is related to this is the people with power uh, had great compassion on people that didn't have power, so much so that we, we kind of had parties together. Uh, one of, it's actually one of my favorite weeks in my neighborhood because people came out of their houses and it was hot in their houses. So they come out in their houses, they talk out in the street. We had like a block party. People would bring grills and they would cook the food before it went bad. We would talk, we'd share, we'd help each other. We cared about each other in those moments. As Christians, we're supposed to care about other people, especially people that don't have what we have and know what we know and don't have the Jesus that we have and the church that we have and all those blessings. We should have compassion for them. And the fourth thing related as well, people without pow with power should be humble and gracious toward people that don't have power. I heard about so many people suffering without power that I felt guilty for the fact that I had power and some people would tease me. Some of it wasn't teasing, some of it was anger. It's, What's the, what the heck? Why do you have power when we don't have power? And I, I wanted to put a banner up on my house and say, sorry, I have power when you don't. How can we help? How can we help? We're available to help. As Christians, we're called to be humble people, humble people, because we have a grace. We have a power that we didn't earn that we didn't deserve, that's not our own. And we ought to be motivated by that gratitude to be gracious and generous and kind to other people. Sometimes Christians look down their noses at people that don't know what we have and have what we have. They're judgmental, they're unkind, they condemn people. One of the things I most hate about social media is all the Christian people that spend their whole time being graceless and harsh toward other people that they think are wrong. Let me point out the 10 ways that you're an idiot. Let me point out the 10 ways that you're wrong about all these things. You're never gonna win a person to Christ with being graceless. You can only win people to Christ by being gracious to hear them, to listen to them, to care about them, to help them know they're not gonna care what you think until they know you care about them. We should remember that everything we have is a gift of God. We don't deserve it, so there's nothing about us in it. There's nothing to be prideful about. Instead, we should be motivated to tremendous compassion and tremendous generosity. And the last thing is this, the people without power needed to get power. They needed power of their own. No amount of caring and sharing could substitute for them having their own direct access to power. I remember how Duke Energy shipped people in from all over the country. These whole crews and their trucks were coming down the street like an invading army. But this case, they were coming to bring power, to bring light. And when the lights went on, I'll never forget it. When I remember the moment that it happened, when the power came back on, you heard people cheering in our neighborhood, up and down the street, like it had just been the end of a war or something. People were running out, ah, they were so excited. Well, that's what God wants to happen when Christians make disciples. The angels in heaven, it says, rejoice when people turn back to the Lord. So I wish we were just as concerned about the people that are walking in spiritual darkness, the people that are lost without hope in the world, the people that may not even know they're lost, but they're running away from God, which means they're going in the wrong direction. They don't have the love of God. They don't have the power of a church family. They're disconnected, disconnected from Christ, disconnected from a church. So how can God use us to connect them once again? Now I'm going to close with an illustration about using this power or witnessing and power. And I'm going to 
deliberately make it a contrast to what I've been saying. Because the word power, as I'm using it, could be misunderstood. Sometimes we think of power as in power over other people. And what you need to think instead of a lot of power is powering up other people. It's not a power that overwhelms and intimidates and, and obliterates everything in its path. Most of the time, the power of the Holy Spirit is much more gentle than that and much more soft than that. Sometimes it's like a candle in a dark room or a lamp in a dark corner of a place. It's like bread baking that just kind of permeates a house with a sense of goodness. It's like a smile or a kind act on the face of a child or a person. It's two people embracing because they're in love. It's grace. It's grace. I read a story about a 19th century skeptic who promised a great British preacher of that day, Alexander McLaren, that he would go to his church and listen to him preach for four Sundays in a row. And it was previously announced that, that he'd be preaching about the basic tenets of the Christian faith. And so the man was true to his word. He came and he went for four Sundays and he said, I'll make my decision at the end of those four Sundays. And on the last day, he came up to the church. He publicly professed his faith in Christ. He was baptized, became a member of that church and started the path of discipleship. Well, McLaren was delighted, but he couldn't resist the impulse to ask which of his four sermons finally brought the man to his decision. And the skeptic replied, your sermons, sir, were helpful but they were not what finally persuaded me. He said that after church one Sunday, he stopped to help an elderly lady on a slippery sidewalk as he was going home. And this woman didn't know him, but she looked up in his face and sweetly said, I wonder if you know my savior, Jesus. He's everything in the world to me and I care about you and I want you to know him too. Well, she had no way of knowing that it would be just the right thing to say to just the right person at just the right time in his life but she had the power and she had the light. See, the Holy Spirit knew all those things. The Holy Spirit was ready for that moment. And it changed a skeptic's heart as no sermon ever could, and he was saved. So that's what God wants us to do with the power that is available to us. He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can use that power to help others. So if you wanna change the world for the better, you wanna make a difference, then the first and most important thing you need to do is to make sure constantly continually plugged in to the power of God in Christ, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, on my own behalf, but I think also on behalf of maybe other people that are listening to me, I confess the times in my life that I thought it all depended on me, that I had to fix it, that I had to solve it. Sometimes, I reach a place of weakness and despair and I cry out to you, God, help me. I turn to you in that moment and that's the right way to turn that leads to new life. But other times, especially when things are going well, I think I'm, I'm good, I got this, God. You could sit and watch and maybe you'll be proud of what I accomplish and then I fail and then I have to be reminded once again that apart from you, I can do nothing. Apart from you, I can do nothing. All things are possible. The Bible says, for those who believe, which means they're trusting in you to do what we can't possibly do. So Lord God, I pray that you would help us to turn back to you and to turn to you for simple reliance. I don't have a complicated step-by-step -step formula today. It's really just as simple as saying, we need you, God. We need you to do what only you can do. We need you to work in us and through us. And we're making ourselves fully available, fully yielded to the work of your spirit. And at the end of the day, we'll make sure you get all the praise and all the glory for apart from you, truly we can do nothing. But Christ in us, which is the Holy Spirit in us, is greater than anyone or anything else that we're gonna come against in this world. Help us to use that power for good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.